Hey, it's Jason from the Sub 70 Podcast, and this podcast with William McGirt's going to be a little bit different. We went over our normal time frame uh, that we normally try to do with these. We were just having such a great conversations with William. We just kept it going, so this will be a two-parter. Hope you guys enjoy it. Um, William is truly one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in professional golf, and uh, it was a true pleasure to have him on the program and uh, hopefully he gets back out in the PGA Tour soon. And uh, without further ado, here's William. Well, I would like to welcome to the Sub-70 podcast the winner of the 2016 Memorial Tournament on the PGA Tour, William McGirt, to the podcast. William, thanks so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Well, my first question is, I know you had uh, season-ending surgery uh, last year on your hip. Uh, how did the surgery's outcome uh, turn out? How's progress coming along? And, and how bad was the hip when they actually got in there and, and had to repair it? Well, yeah, start with how the hip was before. Um, so I have what is called FAI, it's femoral acetabular impingement. Um, and it had really limited the range of motion in my left hip. And being the lead hip and that I'm always turning into it, it became a problem and got worse pretty quickly because of the amount of balls that, that I hit. Um, Dr. Tom Bird in Nashville, Tennessee, um, did the surgery. And, uh, you know, all in all, things have gone very well so far. Um, I just started hitting balls again first of the year. Uh, feels great. Um, definitely a lot cleaner, smoother. Um, you know, no catching, no clicking and popping during the turns. Um, which is something I haven't had for a year. Um, you know, it, it, right now it's easy to say everything went very well because it feels so good. Um, that being said, I'm only able to hit 50, 60 golf balls right now before it gets tired. Um, you know, when you don't, when you don't use muscles for four months, they kind of start to t- deteriorate on you. And, um, you know, it's going to take me a while to build the strength back up in those, um, you know, even, even with all the rehabbing that I've done, uh, a lot of riding the bike and, and on the elliptical and all the exercises to build the strength back up, you still got to build golf strength. And it's one thing to, to work a muscle out and try to build strength in it. But when you're using it for the golf swing, it's totally different. And, um, you know, having to build the strength up that way as well is going to take me a little bit of time, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how everything is. So the day before I had surgery, they checked all of my range of motion and stuff, and I had less than five degrees of internal rotation in my left leg, left hip. And uh, the PGA Tour average is around 40 degrees. So that's what I was fighting all last year. I couldn't turn into my left side, and, you know, as a result of that, I just kind of fake a turn and throw my arms at it and hope that I timed it to square the club face up. And, uh, it worked some weeks. It didn't work some weeks, but uh, hopefully, after having this procedure done, and and you know, once I rebuild the the strength and then the endurance part back up, uh, I'll be able to play better than I than I had the last few years. So, was it actually probably one hell of an accomplishment to finish where you did on the money list last year with literally a left hip not working? Like, what kind of grind was that? Just to sort of like you said, piecemeal it together enough to be able to compete against you know other guys that are healthy that had to be uh, you know difficult stressful the whole nine yards right because it's got to be a very tough decision of saying do I actually shut it down and do surgery versus trying to rehab that had to be a uh, an interesting year to say the least last year yeah and and really sometime mid-April uh was really when it all came to a head you know I wasn't playing well and it and it felt like something was wrong, but I just didn't know, you know, I'd go out and I'd have, I might go for a week where it didn't hurt. And then I might have another week where it hurts every single day. And I got to the point to where I couldn't stay asleep at night. I wasn't getting good rest because every time I'd move, it would bother me and it would wake me up. And, you know, a lot of things led to having surgery and, you know, San Antonio last year was, was really where it started bothering me all the time. And I missed the cut there. The first day, yeah, I don't even remember what I shot. It was not good. And I could not move. You know, I had a great 
couple of days of practice, I was starting to hit it really well, go out the first round, and I mean, I could not make a backswing, much less turn into my left side. And I started talking to my therapist, and I said, you know what? It's time to get this thing looked at. And he said, well, he said, I'm going to call somebody that I know at Nashville Hip and see if I can get you in to see Dr. Burt. He said, he's the best in the business. He actually developed the arthroscopic hip procedure. And uh, he said, I think that's who you need to go see. So that was Thursday night. He called him on Friday, and uh, they got me in Monday morning at 6.30. I had had x-rays done. I took those with me, and Dr. Bird has his way of doing things. He wanted new x-rays done. Um, and I walked in after the x-rays, and we took a look at him, and he says, you have a torn labor. And I, you know, I have very limited medical knowledge. And I said, but I thought you had to have an MRI to decide if there was a torn labrum. He said, you do. And he pulls out his pen and he circles a spot on the screen and he said, right here, this is where it's going to be. And I said, okay. He says, now, you're going to go down the street and you're going to get the MRI done. So I do. I bring the disc back. He pops it in the computer and he said, what did I tell you? Right there. Right dead in the middle of that circle. And I said, hmm, this guy knows what he's talking about. And, uh, from then, it was like, okay, what are my options? And, you know, he said, look, he said, the last thing I want to do is cut on somebody. He said, you always run the risk of problems, complications, and not even coming back from it. And he said, if we can do it through rehab and exercises and stuff, we're going to try that first. And once he saw the MRI and the x-ray, he said, you really don't have a choice. And he said you need surgery. You know, that was, it was not what I wanted to hear, but at the same time, it was like, okay, if this guy's telling me this is what I need, then I need to start planning accordingly. And, um, you know, I thought about getting second opinions from some other doctors and I thought about going to see Dr. Kelly in, in New York city at the hospital for special surgery. And I mentioned that to Mike Voigt, who heads up Dr. Bird's physical therapy department. And he says, well, he said, you can go if you want. He said, but I can tell you, uh, Dr. Kelly's already seen your stuff. He said, Dr. Bird and Dr. Kelly talk a lot about their cases, um, especially when they involve professional athletes, because they want to make sure that they're seeing everything. And, you know, they rely heavily on each other's opinions for stuff like that. And uh, so once I heard that, I mean, there was there was no doubt in my mind that Dr. Bird was going to do the surgery. And uh you know, it kind of started the plan when I should have surgery, what what I should expect, and all this stuff. And, you know, I thought about having surgery in the middle of the year last year to give me the maximum amount of time to come back. You know, I was going to end up losing the rest of my exemption for that year, and I'm already losing my exemption into all the invitationals and stuff that I had remaining from my win at Memorial this year. But I knew that, you know, that was really kind of secondary at that point. If I wanted to continue playing, I needed to have this done. So in the best case scenario, when do you see yourself back at the P- on the PGA Tour, you know, 100% ready to go? Well, the way the PGA Tour does this, I get five rehab starts on the web.com tour. And I'm hoping to take some of those in the summer. You know, when, I'm not sure because I don't know how long it's going to take me to get back to full golf strength. You know, there's... There's a huge difference between being able to hit balls and being able to play golf. And then there's an even bigger difference between playing golf and playing tournament golf. And when I feel like I'm back in tournament shape, then I'll start taking some of my uh, rehab starts on the web tour. And, you know, hopefully shortly after that, I'll be able to get back to the PGA tour. Web starts don't go against your major medical then for your, events you have to, to no. okay so that's perfect though. that's actually no. great to go out there and just kind of see what you got right i didn't know they did that that actually it makes common sense i suppose yeah i mean it's it's a great way to kind of kind of see where you are without losing your starts on the pga tour because you know if you didn't have that avenue like i'll have 27 events when i start back playing on the pga tour to make what uh 
number 125 on the FedEx Cup list this year makes. So points wise, you know, I'm not really looking at whenever I come back. I have to make what number 125 makes this year to fulfill my major medical exemption. Um, you know, whether that's you know next season or the following season, I think I have three years um, that I can be out. I don't want to be out that long. I mean, I'm start, you know after starting to hit balls again the last couple of weeks, I'm kind of chomping at the bit, but I know that I'm nowhere close. Um, but you know, it, it's great to have that avenue because if I didn't, you know, I could go back out there and play two or three tournaments and go, wow, you know what? I'm nowhere close to to being in golf shape again, and I've lost three starts. Right. Um, so exactly. that's that's one thing the tour does great for us. And it's good for the web dot com, right? You got a PGA Tour exempt player out in the event. It 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 brings some star power to that you know uh, tournament as well. So I can see where it works on on both sides with this. So uh, since you have been out for a while, what have you you know what have you been doing with your downtime? I'm assuming spend some time with the family. But is there any other hobbies you kind of got to do a little bit with your time off? And and at some level, has that downtime been uh, nice for as busy as you guys are throughout the year? Well, it's it's been great to be home and spend time with my wife and kids. Um, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And, um, you know, had I been playing this year, I would have probably missed some some milestones. Um, you know, while I was home, my six-year-old learned how to ride a bike without training wheels. Um, I was home to, to help teach him how to do that. He, I watched him lose his first two teeth, you know, which doesn't sound like a lot, but to them it's a huge milestone. And – it's something that you'll never forget as a parent. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of fun, uh, being at home to, to spend time with them every day because, you know, we travel so much and, and yes, my family gets to travel with me a lot, but at the same time, you know, they might be on the road with me, but I'm gone eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So it's not like I'm always with them and, you know, running, running carpool to and from school every day, picking him up, taking him to swim lessons, taking him to golf and, and taking my daughter to dance and, you know, having a daddy daughter lunch date and, you know, having a breakfast date with my wife, you know, it's been a lot of fun to, to do some of that stuff. And, um, you know, my son has kind of gotten into fishing for some reason here lately. And, uh, you know, we've been the few days that we've seen the sun and it's been warm. We've come out to fish and, uh, he loves it. And, you know, now he's he's starting to want to come with Daddy to the golf course in the afternoons to hit balls. Um, you know, we spent about an hour and a half out here yesterday, and you know it was fun. You know, he's starting to kind of get into it and want to go to the golf course. And you know, I don't force him. I look at him and say, "Hey, bud, I'm gonna go hit some balls. Do you want to come?" Yeah. And we'll jump in the golf cart and ride out here and and hit balls for a little while. And you know, it's fun just to kind of get to hang out with your kids for a while. And it's stuff that, you know, we normally wouldn't have the opportunity to do um, when we're in the middle of the season. So when you do get back, um, you know, the, the, the guys at Srixon Cleveland have some new stuff out uh, on the product life cycles for uh, 2019 season and a new golf ball. Uh, when do you start that process of potentially looking at new equipment and have you started, which I know for you guys, the golf ball can be somewhat diff- not difficult, but but you got to have the, the ball perform the way you want the ball to perform, I guess what I'm trying to say. When yeah. will you start looking at the new stuff and what you might put in and what kind of uh, bag you might have set up for next year, or is that going to be down the road at this point with your injury that you really can't assess that until you're you know, back on all eight cylinders again? You know, some of it you can't really assess until you get back to playing you know, close to full strength. You know, some of my equipment changed throughout the year last year simply because I wasn't able to turn as well. Um, so we had to adjust some clubs with shafts and, and other things to just basically let me get through the year. Um, now, the, the golf balls, you know, we get a lot of this stuff well before it goes to public. You know, I've been playing the new uh, Z Star XD6, gosh, probably. Uh, I'm going to guess July or August, maybe even before that. I don't remember exactly when they became available for us. Um, you know, the one thing with Strixon, 
every single golf ball that they've come out with, for me, has performed better than the version before that. And, you know, they kind of know when something comes out, if I test it in a prototype stage and I love it then, that when it comes out, I want it ASAP. And I'm not a guy that likes to change a bunch, but, you know, when they come out with a new ball that I've tested, you know, throughout the prototype process and I tell them I like it, they know that as soon as that thing becomes available, they better not hide it from me Um, because I'm going to walk in and ask, hey, when's it out? When's it out? I want it now. You know, the driver, um, I was one of the first ones to put the new driver in play last summer. The fairway woods came out. They were available to us at Greensboro. I put the three wood in. I hit it on Tuesday, stuck it in the bag on Wednesday. I'm like, let's go. Um, The new irons came out when we were in Kentucky last summer. I had them built on Monday. And normally, normally I would take a week or two of playing with them and practicing with them a bunch to stick them in play. Rob built them for me Monday morning. And I took the old ones and had him ship them home Tuesday morning. But, you know, I fell in love with them right then and there. Um, but, you know, some of that stuff shaft-wise uh, could change once I'm able to get back to full strength because, you know, I may be stronger. Uh, my golf swing is definitely going to change, hopefully uh, shallow out everything a little bit. So we may have to, to tweak some shafts and tweak lofts and lies. But, you know, I kind of know what I like and, and – I can kind of walk in and grab stuff out of the drawer in the trailer and say, hey, this is this is me right here. Go ahead and build them up. How did you start uh, playing golf when I when I was doing research for the outline here for the podcast? I know you played a lot of baseball growing up, but but how did how did you get introduced to the game? And then, you know, how did you sort of transition to the to the idea that this is the sport you're really going to focus on? So pretty much everyone in my family played golf. And my grandparents lived on a little golf course where I grew up. And, I mean, when I was able to stand up, I would tag along with whoever was playing golf. Um, And somebody was playing pretty much every day, whether it was my aunt, my uncle, my grandfather. um, It didn't matter. My grandmother, I'd ride along, and they would let me hit some shots and chip and putt. And, you know, I was kind of hooked on it as a kid. And I played a bunch until I was eight years old. And when I was eight, I started playing baseball and loved baseball, um, was pretty good. And I didn't play golf again until my 15th birthday. And I went out with my grandfather and had not touched the golf club in eight, in seven or eight years and shot 83 the first round back and was kind of hooked again. And I continued to play baseball right up until I graduated from high school. But I realized real quick that there were no grossly undersized slow catchers in the major leagues that hit for average (laughs) and uh i kind of gave up on baseball and you know i was really hooked on golf at the time and uh you know i went from shooting in the 80s to the 70s and the mid 70s within probably six months and it took me about a year or so maybe a year and a half to to break par for the first time and you know i just started and kept practicing and working on different stuff. And, um, you know, it was, it was always kind of a dream to play on the PGA tour. And, you know, when it came time to go to college, you know, I had a few colleges that were interested in me, but nowhere that was a golf quote unquote powerhouse. But the great thing with golf is it's just you. And on the PGA tour, it's just you and a caddy, you know, you get out of it, what you put into it. And, you know, I've never been afraid of hard work. You know, am I the most naturally talented guy on the PGA Tour? Now nah, I'm probably in the bottom five. But when it comes to, to hard work, you know, I, there aren't many guys that are going to outwork me. It's just something I've always seen as a challenge. And I love it when some t- somebody tells me I can't do something. That's just more fuel to make me want to do it that much more. You know, and, and I love – I think the one thing I love about golf is there's no such thing as perfect. And no matter how well you played yesterday, you got to go out and prove yourself again the next day. And I love the practice aspect of it. I mean, I play maybe a half a dozen rounds a year that aren't a tournament or a practice round or a pro-am or something related to that, you know, whether it's corporate golf or something like that. Um, 
at our home club here in Spartanburg, I played two rounds last year. I played once early in the year for a uh, uh, round that we had auctioned off for charity. And then my son and I played in the father's son on Father's Day. Um, you know, I come out here a bunch and practice, but, you know, I just don't play golf to, for the sake of playing golf. It's just not something that gets me going. Um, but if you hand me a scorecard, a rule sheet, and a pencil, and a whole location sheet, it's time to go. Hey, everyone. Some feedback we have been getting at Sub70 Golf is to get a demo program uh, up and running, which hopefully the next couple of weeks we will have it open. So all the clubs that you see online with our factory direct pricing – for basically a $20 fee, you'd be able to test them for a couple of weeks, get some feedback, let us know what you're thinking. And then from that, we could hand build your golf clubs exactly to your specification here in Sycamore, Illinois. Expectations redefined. Uh, we hope we certainly bring that to our customer base. And thanks again for listening to the podcast. And then after college, you know, you, you decide to turn pro, and it's not a straight path, you know, right to the PGA Tour. Lots of uh, events on the mini tour. And, and looking back, um, how did that time in the game as a young professional sort of shape your career and, and, and make you the player that you are today? In other words, did that grind and that, um, you know, sometimes a hardship out there to, to kind of get notching up each level to sort of help uh, solidify that you had the ability and you could keep going up each notch to sort of get there. I mean, looking back to that, was it sort of invaluable to have that experience? For sure. But see, I also didn't turn pro straight out of college like most guys did. Um, I graduated in 2001 and got married in 2004. And my dad and I ran junior golf tournaments uh, throughout the school year. And I worked with him for a couple of years and I'd never, you know, coming out of college, I'd never really done anything that would justify saying, Hey, you know, you got a chance to play this game for a living. Um, but in 2003, I won the North Carolina amateur and the Cardinal amateur and played, you know, pretty well and made match play at the USAM. And, uh, I thought, you know, if there's ever a time now, it's kind of the time. And by the time I made that decision, it was too late to go to Q school that year. All the mini tours were done. So I played a couple of amateur tournaments again in 04. And we were married late or Memorial Day weekend of 05. Went on our honeymoon and I played my first professional event the week after we got back from our honeymoon. Um, and then, you know, I didn't, I didn't even get a web tour card until 2010. I finally made the finals of Q school in 2009. You know, all those years on the mini tours, grinding away, you know, putting putting a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars into the pot every week, knowing that only, you know, seventy five, eighty percent of that's actually going into the purse. You know, you realize real quick that you gotta buckle down and, and play hard if you wanna even make your money back. And you know, it's it's basically legalized gambling, but you know, it, it's tournament experience, it gets you ready and you know, you learn real quick. You got to figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are and how you can turn all your weaknesses into strengths. As you were kind of going up that ladder and, um, you know, making out to, let's say, the web.com tour, looking back, what in your golf game got better for you to be able to compete at the, the, the higher levels? Was it mental? Was it physical? Was the golf swing actually just getting better? You know, what was the attributes that you had that kind of, you know, led you on that ascension upward? Well, I think it was a combination of, of everything. You know, definitely my short game got better. I started to become a little bit better putter each year. You know, I could make you a great argument that I was a much better ball striker when I played the mini tours. If I hit the ball as well now as I did when I played mini tours, I'd be a lot better. Um, I don't think I hit it near as well now, but my short game is a thousand times better. Um, I think that's what held me back those early years at the final or the second stage of tour school was that, you know, we were playing golf courses that were a little tougher than what I was used to playing on and definitely some different conditions. Um, you know, with it being in the fall, golf courses are going into dormancy and you haven't played on that all year. So it was a little different, but, you know, I learned you know, I, I had a lot more shots that I needed to learn how to hit. And, you know, the mental side of it, you know, I, 
I can still be somewhat of a hothead, but early in my career, wow. I look back at it and go, whew, I was a major hothead. You know, I'd make a bogey and it would it would hang with me for three or four or five holes. Whereas now you kind of shrug it off because you can get on the bogey train real quick on the PGA Tour. The golf courses are so difficult. You can't let that stuff linger with you. And, you know, I think everything in my game just steadily improved. And I think that's what led to, to me getting to where I am now. And that I think a lot of that goes with the amount of work that I put into it. Because, you know, when, when I was playing mini tours, my wife was still working. She would leave for work at 7.30 in the morning, and I'd go to the golf course. She'd get home at 5 or 5.30, and I'd come home about 5 or 5.30. So I spent a bunch of time working and trying to turn weaknesses into strengths. When you get out on the PGA Tour for that first year, what what kind of learning curve is that? I mean, I I know from talking to a bunch of the guys, you're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit because you have not played the courses. Let's assume most of the other guys have. H- how is that first year to get adjusted, to, you know, that you're out there at the highest level playing against the best in the world? Is it? Did it seem fairly natural that you were ready for it, or was that process fairly difficult as well the first year you're out there? Well, I think the biggest thing is learning a new golf course every week. And you know, take Palm Springs, for instance. My rookie year, it was a, a five-round tournament with a four-round cut. Well, I'm flying back from Hawaii, so I get in mid-morning on Monday. Now I've got to see two golf courses on Monday and two golf courses on Tuesday and be ready to tee it up on Wednesday. And that, I think, was the hardest thing, was, was adjusting and trying to learn those golf courses in basically a day. You know, you can play the Monday Pro-Am to give yourself another look, but you had Tuesday to learn a golf course for the first time that you're playing against guys who've played this golf course for 20, 25 years. You know, and it always amazed me to watch guys. Tiger never showed up until Tuesday night or Wednesday. You'd never see him on a Monday or Tuesday. Phil was the same way. Stricker, you might see him on Tuesday. He'd play the Wednesday Pro-Am. And you're like, what what do these guys do differently? Well, they've played the golf course so many times, they go out for a program and all they want to know is how firm the greens are and how fast they are. And and if the golf course is dry or, or soft. Because they've got all their notes from past years that they don't really have to worry about. You know, they know where to hit it and where not to hit it. They know that, you know, in Vegas things are gonna to break towards the stratosphere. There's just that kind of pull. You know, pebble, don't ever hit your ball where the flag's between you and the ocean. You know, there were a lot of things that that really I had to learn in a day that they've learned over 20-plus years. And then, yeah, and that's where those, like I said, that's where the guys I've talked to said that first year can be tough. And to get through that gauntlet, you know, and then obviously you've learned because the, the level of consistency you've had since you've, you've been on tour I'm now I'm assuming you're up to those guys' level of comfortability of a tour veteran who's been out on tour and knows the courses. So now it plays into your favor on the flip side of that, I'm assuming. Yeah, and, and you know, the last couple of years, I haven't played a lot of Tuesday practice rounds. I might go out and play nine holes, but, you know, I was in all the Wednesday pro am so, you know, I would take Monday off. That was Monday was my rest day. Tuesday, I would go practice, and I might play nine holes. But then, you know, I played the pro on Wednesday, and I was ready to go. You know, I was able to conserve energy like those guys were doing when I was a rookie, but I didn't have that luxury as a rookie. And, you know, I think my second year on tour, you know, I went back to Q school and got my card back, even though I had conditional status. Well, now I got back to a full card. But when I went to Hawaii to start my second year on tour, I knew what to expect. You know, I showed up. 32 times at a tournament my rookie year and I had played two golf courses. I had played Pebble Beach and Spyglass. I'd never played Monterey Peninsula and I'd played Sedgefield uh, in Greensboro. Those are the only two golf courses. Well, actually I had played uh, Houston. I had Monday qualified for Houston the year before. So those were the only golf courses that I had played as a rookie going out there. And, you know, there's, there's a ton of little things that you don't even think about where to stay, 
you know, you go to a place like L.A., you can be five miles from the golf course, and it can take you an hour and a half. You know, it was little things like that that I learned my rookie year that helped me tremendously the next year. And, you know, you're able to to not make the same mistakes as a, as a second-year player that you made your rookie year. And, you know, experience is huge. Um, you know, I'd say – the game is changing now to where experience I don't think is quite as big a deal as it was eight or 10 years ago. Um, the kids coming out now are so much better than we were, uh, you know, eight or 10 years ago, but you know, there still is a little bit of local knowledge in some of these places. Um, you know, Pebble beach and San Diego and, and Vegas, you know, some of those places, there's a lot of local knowledge that you're only going to get through experience. Um, you know, I go through and, and look at my yardage book from time to time and all the notes that I've made over the years. And, you know, you, you go back and you find your yardage book from your rookie year and, you know, you can see where you've written the notes in, but you know it was blank when you started the year. Let's talk about the win that you had um, when you won Mr. Nicholas's tournament at the Memorial. And, and we'll get into it a little bit, but my my first question is that golf course, and I've not played it, but that golf course is so highly regarded from an architectural standpoint in your opinion what makes that one of the best golf courses on the pga tour and what makes the architecture uh, and i'm assuming you agree with this so spectacular you know of, of what he designed there well you know that may be the best tournament that we have as a whole um there there aren't many things that they haven't thought about up there whether it's the golf course or how they take care of us or how they take care of our wives and family. Um, you know, it, it's such a special place to go to and you can see where Mr. And Mrs. Nicholas have both had their influence and their hands on that tournament. And it's something, you know, I didn't get in my rookie year. I was an alternate and I didn't go. And then I was an alternate the next year, but I decided to go up and play a practice round because my caddy kept telling me, if you can get in this tournament, it is perfect for you. This golf course is right up your alley. You know, you're thinking 7,500 yard golf course for an average length hitter, but it's perfect for me. It fits my eye very well, and I'm just super comfortable out there. Now, I'd never played that well. I'd never broken 70 out there until the year I won. First time I'd ever broken 70, I shot 68 the second round. And then shot 64 on Saturday. And I remember somebody in the interview asked me, you know, what it was that was different and, you know, how you were able to break 70 this year. You know, I'd shot 70 three or four or five times before, but I'd never broken 70. And, you know, I think the big thing was I got more and more comfortable and some of that experience kind of kicked in and I knew, hey, sometimes you're better off missing the green underneath the hole than you are hitting it 15 feet above the hole and you know when you look at the condition of the place i mean it's absolutely perfect you kind of get excited when you go up there because it's so perfect and you know you, you look at the golf course i mean it's not overly penal off the tee um now they've they've reseeded the rough the last year or two um if you drive it in the rough it's, it's a lot thinner blade now much tougher to hit it out of but, uh, you know, the fairways are fairly generous out there. You know, as you get closer to the hole, it gets much more demanding. Um, there's just some places that you just absolutely can't hit it out there. Um, so you, you really have to be in control of your golf ball at all times. And around the greens, I mean, it's going to be tough. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a place that I'm very comfortable at. It fits my eye very well. And it's more of a an old school design versus some of the newer stuff, even though Muirfield's not what is probably 40 years old. Um, I would consider it more of a, an older design than some of the newer stuff. Um, and I love older golf courses. They're kind of right in front of you. You know, you know how you need to play the hole. There's no hidden tricks, no gimmicks to it. And that's something that I just love. Um, a lot of the newer architecture, it's, to me, it's kind of boring. They've gone out and tried to to create stuff instead of taking the natural lay of the land and, and letting that dictate how you play the hole. And that's just something that I'm not overly fond of. 
you played really well that season when you won the Memorial. And when you're on that back nine on Sunday for a huge, your first win and a huge tournament, it's a huge tournament. Uh, what surprised you the most about, you know, your mindset or how your body reacted under that kind of uh, pressure or you know circumstance well when you look at at the names on that leaderboard on sunday i think if you'd have polled everybody who was watching it there might have been a fraction of one percent that would have picked me i mean it, it was a who's who of the top 20 in the world um but i had been playing well all year and I had had a, t- a couple of chances to win. I had a chance to win at Jackson back in the fall in 2015. And, I, and to this day, I still don't know how the putt missed on 18. But it, it was something that I kind of knew was coming. I felt like it was coming. Um, and the crazy thing is, I had played well the week before at Colonial and finished like 50th. I knew I was hitting it well. I knew I was putting it well. And it just wasn't happening at the time. But I got to Muirfield, and and honestly, every time I drive through the gate there, I kind of get giddy because it's it's such an awesome place to be. And things started to click that week. I could tell, you know, my driving was really good. Uh, my irons were starting to get a little bit more crisp. I started chipping it really well, and uh, and I was and I was starting to make putts. And you, you could kind of see it coming, and it kind of builds the confidence. And, you know, having been in that position a couple of times, I think the biggest thing that I learned from being in that position before was how my body was going to react. You know, I knew that I, everything was going to speed up a little bit. So I knew on Sunday I had to make sure I walked a little slower. I took an extra breath. Um, just little things like that, that the experience factor comes back. And, um, you know, hey – I believed in what I was doing, and trust me, nobody was any happier to see that it was going to be windy and there were going to be storms that rolled in that day than me. I knew if it turned into a shootout, I didn't like my chances, but I knew if it played tough and pars were good scores, that I'd be okay. And, you know, I hung around all day, and I think I was one of two or three players that day that didn't make a bogey. And, you know, I remember in the press conference afterwards, um, sitting beside Mr. Nicholas and, and he was talking and he said, look, he said, everybody else beat themselves with bogeys. He said, he didn't make a bogey in 20 holes. And he said, that's how you won a golf tournament. He said, yeah, he didn't make six, seven birdies. He said, but he didn't make any bogeys. He didn't give anybody a chance. You know, he didn't leave the door open for anybody to sneak in there and take it. And, you know, for somebody like that to, to notice what was going on. And I think, I think some of the conversations I had with him that day after the round kind of springboarded me the rest of the year to keep playing well. When you have that moment after all that work and all that time and and you get a trophy from Jack Nicholas, what is that feeling like? And, And because you had been knocking at the door, is it elation or is it a partially relief to that? You know, you've, you've gotten it done. What's the sort of emotions like when you, get handed that trophy from winning the Memorial Tournament? Well, it's, it's definitely a combination of both. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the bear hug with my caddy, Brandon, afterwards. You know, I make the putt, I walk over to him, we just have a big bear hug, and he says, we did it. We finally did it. You know, we both knew it was coming, but we finally did it. And, you know, for him, he lives in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Um, his wife's an Ohio State grad. She came over that morning. You know, it, it was it was a great moment to share with everybody. And you know, yeah, you're super excited that you finally won. You, you you've won on the PGA Tour, probably the hardest place in the world to win. And you know, it just happens that arguably the greatest golfer of all times is a tournament host, and he's the one handing you the trophy just makes it that much sweeter um and and some of the things that he said and some of the conversations we've had since you know it, it's been a huge boost for me confidence wise that hey you know what i might not be the most naturally talented guy out here but this guy believes 
that I can win again. And uh, I'll never forget the conversation we had uh, Tuesday afternoon at Augusta in 2017. He was going in for the champion's dinner, and, and my family and I happened to be out in front taking a few pictures. And he jumps off the golf cart to, to walk over and speak to us. And, and he said, hey, if you can win at my place, you can win here. You know, I, I played really well the first couple of days and some really tough conditions. And, you know, I, I kind of kept thinking back to what he said. You know, hey, those golf courses are very, very similar. You know, a lot of his design at Muirfield Village he incorporated a lot of things from Augusta because he loves Augusta so much. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities in the two golf courses, even though they're, they're very different designs. There's a lot of similarities where you don't necessarily have to hit the ball at the hole to get it close. But now you take your target, you've got a very small target to hit it to, to get it to, to contour the green, to move the ball towards the hole. Now the penalty is if you miss that spot, you're going to have an awfully hard two putt or up and down. You know, it, it, a lot of that stuff that happened in the conversations that I had with him, you know, it really kind of propelled me the rest of the year and into 2017 to, to play well. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of that I'll be able to look back on and, and lean on heavily when I, when I do get back to competitive golf, um, once I'm able to get this hip going again.